Hi, and welcome to Resin Chem Tech. This is part one of what will be a multi-part series on building a 1980s-style coin-operated retro arcade machine. In part one, I'm going to cover the planning, the design, and some of the parts that I used in building my arcade. So let's get started. So about a year ago, I did a really quick highlight video of my retro arcade machine. It really didn't go into a lot of details, just kind of provided some of the features and a quick overview. And a lot of you had questions, and despite the fact that I've got a full blog dedicated to the build of this, which I'll link to up here and down in the video description, I thought I would go through a multi-part series to talk about how I came up with the design plan, how I actually built it, and eventually how I actually got the LED lights and RetroPie working on the machine. So in this part, I'm actually going to talk about the design, how I come up with the plans, and a little bit about the parts that I acquired to build it. In future parts of this, we'll talk about the actual build of the cabinet itself. So I'd always wanted a retro arcade machine. In fact, I even had a spot in my basement reserved for where it was going to go. And initially, I started looking at retail multi-cade machines. I thought that was the way I was going to go. But as I began looking at them, a lot of them, they didn't have the look of an authentic 80s arcade machine. I couldn't find a machine that had all the games that I wanted from, from my teen years. I would find, you know, Donkey Kong on one, but Pac-Man would be on another. I couldn't find a single machine with all the games that I wanted. They would also often stretch the aspect ratio to fill the full screen, which made the game not look authentic. And finally, they were extremely expensive. They would start out anywhere from $1,800 to well over $4,000. So it was around this same time that my co-workers gave me a Raspberry Pi as a Christmas gift. Now this was well before my smart home and DIY electronics uh, days. This was about four years ago, and I wasn't quite sure what to do with the Raspberry Pi. So a little bit of searching led me to some software called RetroPie. That allows you to run original code versions of classic arcade games, plus a lot of other emulators. So the first thing I did was install RetroPie on my Raspberry Pi, hooked it up to a TV, and used a PlayStation controller, and immediately found that, sure enough, I could run these retro games. So that actually got me thinking, could I possibly build my own machine that would give me all the games that I wanted? So what I did is what most people do. I headed off to YouTube to start looking for videos on how building your own retro arcade machine. And to be honest, at first I was a little bit discouraged because what I found were people with large workshops and these massive uh, table saws where they could cut a four by eight sheet of uh, plywood. I don't have that and I have very limited woodworking skills, but I want to let you know, don't be discouraged. Here are the only power tools I use to build my arcade machine. I didn't even have a table saw, so I borrowed a portable table saw off of a friend. And the only tool I purchased was that palm router. Everything else you see here, I already owned, as all I used. Uh, the, even the finish nailer is optional. I only used it for one small part, and to be honest, you wouldn't need that. So as long as you've got some patience, you really don't need a large workshop or a lot of woodworking experience to build one of these arcade machines. So I decided to take a shot at building my own. But before I started, I knew I was going to spend a lot of time planning because I was only going to get one shot at this. And I knew one of the most important parts were going to be the controls. What type of controls did I need? How many buttons did I need? I wanted this to be two players, so how far apart did the, each side need to be so you weren't bumping into each other? So I decided the first thing I was going to do was order some lower cost basic arcade controls off of Amazon. So I got these in and a, a template that I thought I could use, and I spent a weekend just throwing together a quick prototype box. And once I had this thing built, I hooked it up to the TV and I started playing some different games. As I played through these, there were a few things that I discovered. For one, I knew I was going to want a trackball and a spinner control. Another thing was in this particular case, those arcade controls were too close together. Two players, you were, you were bumping shoulders and there really wasn't, wasn't room. The buttons themselves just didn't have quite the right feel to them. But the biggest thing I discovered were the joysticks. Now most joysticks have what are called eight-way control. They register in eight different directions. But when you're playing some of these classic games like Space Invaders or Donkey Kong or Pac-Man, they expect a four-way joystick. 
And if you don't hit that joystick in exactly the right direction, Pac-Man or Donkey Kong doesn't move and it gets very frustrated. Other games, though, need an 8-way joystick. So ideally, I wanted to try to find a joystick that could be toggled or switched between 4-way and 8-way. I'm going to come back to the controls and the parts in a minute, but first I want to talk about my plans for the cabinet. So when it came to the cabinet, one of the first things I needed to decide was the overall dimensions. Now, a little bit of research told me that most standard arcade cabinets from the 80s were 72 inches tall. So I knew my cabinet was going to be 6 foot. The width would be somewhat determined by both the size of the display and the control panel itself. But the depth of the cabinet was completely arbitrary. Since I would be using an LCD screen and just a Raspberry Pi, I really didn't need hardly any depth at all. So the depth is going to be determined by what I thought made it look right. With that, I started drawing sketches. And I drew, and I drew to scale, starting out at 1A scale, and I kept modifying this. Uh, eventually, at some point, I actually got up to drawing these at near half scale until I thought I had a design that I wanted to work with. Now, before you ask, unfortunately, I do not have electronic versions of these, but I have uh, taken uh, large size photos. I'm going to put those in a GitHub repo. So if you actually want to see my, my final designs, uh, those are, will be available on GitHub. One other thing I should mention as I was designing these, I wanted everything to be upgradable and replaceable without having to take any part of the cabinet apart. So I was trying to find a way to build the bezel around the monitor so the monitor could be replaced, the plexiglass could be replaced, I could replace the marquee graphics, uh, I could even upgrade and replace the control panel without taking the entire cabinet apart. So while I was continuing to refine my diagrams and I was waiting for the weather to warm up actually before I started my build, I was also on the search for my other parts, including the arcade controls, and trying to find a way to solve my four-way versus eight-way joystick problem. And during my research, I run across a company called Ultimark. No, they didn't sponsor this video, but I sure am glad that I found them. They make professional level arcade controls, including joysticks that can programmatically be changed between four way and eight way. And now they have four years later, uh, even more advanced models uh, than were available when I bought my controls. But they offer the whole range of, of arcade controls, including again, trackballs, spinners, and light guns, uh, everything that I wanted for my arcade control. Now, one issue was the fact I'm in the U.S. and this company was located in London, England. So I did want to go ahead and get my order in because I wanted to have all my parts on hand before I started the build. And I will add that these parts don't come cheap. They are professional grade arcade controls, but I spent about half the money of the total build of my cabinet just on the control panel parts, but it was well worth the investment. So I will also add Altmark was very responsive. Obviously, this is the first time I had done this. I had a lot of questions, uh, but they answered all of them very quickly. So I placed my order and surprisingly, within about a week, I received my shipment, even though it was coming from overseas. This is a, a partial view of some of the Altmark parts. A couple of parts that I'm going to call out. I'll get into building the control panel in, in a later episode here, but this is the uh, IPAC. This is what allows uh, all those controls, including the individual LED button control. This is that joystick that, again, has a servo and a restrictor plate that allows me to change it from uh, four-way to eight-way. So those were big com key components of the control panel. I also had started ordering other parts. Uh, I got my coin door from a company called X-Arcade. Again, they were very responsive when I had some confusion about the door and thought it might uh, have been broken. It wasn't. Um, ordered some speakers, uh, some other miscellaneous parts, power supplies, the lights for the uh, marquee area. And then I also went ahead and ordered my graphics from a company called Games on Graphics. I will leave links to all these companies down below. Again, none of them sponsored this video. None of them supplied any of these products to me. Uh, I did purchase them all. But uh, you can design all of your own uh, marquee or your graphics. They also order uh, vinyl for the side of your cabinet a lot of predefined templates, but you can also custom design your own. So I think it is worth mentioning that for me, my design revolved around the 80s coin-operated arcade games. If when I was done, if I could play Atari or Nintendo or Sega games on this machine as well, that would be a bonus, but I was really targeting the 80s arcade coin-operated games. There are a couple of other things I'm going to go ahead and mention here. I'll get into much more detail in later parts of this series, but a few other design things here. While it's not authentic, I did want to add an, what I call an administrative control panel on the back. 
And on that control panel would be a button uh, to power up and power down the Raspberry Pi separately from the master uh, cabinet power. I also wanted to add a joystick toggle. This was built as a precaution. If I couldn't figure out how to get those joysticks to work programmatically, I wanted a physical button that I could toggle back and forth between four and eight way. Turned out I didn't need it, but I put it there just in case. I also added a master volume control and a couple of USB ports that were connected to the unused uh, USB ports on the Raspberry Pi. That would allow me to uh, do updates or upload additional games, or I could actually plug in a PlayStation or Xbox controller to play those types of games. Or if nothing else, you could just plug your phone in during an extended gaming session and charge your phone. I did also opt to add a couple of, of our, uh, pinball buttons on each side of the arcade. And as I mentioned before, to make the cabinet maintainable, I did want the control panel to be hinged, a top panel to be hinged where I could get to the marquee graphics and the lighting and the entire back panel to be hinged to allow access to the inside wiring of the cabinet. Again, those are just some of the other design decisions that I made for my cabinet and I'll get into those individual design decisions in much more detail in later parts of this series. So at this point, I had my design, I had most of my parts, I was ready to start building. In part two of this series, I'm actually going to cover the cabinet construction itself. In later parts, which I hope to release once a week, I will cover the control panel, uh, the internal wiring, and eventually get into RetroPie and RGB Commander on how all of the LED buttons were controlled. Well, that's going to wrap it up for part one of this series. If you found anything that you liked or was useful, uh, do me a favor and hit that like button. That lets both me and YouTube know you'd like to see more videos like this. If you'd like to see my other videos, uh, hit that subscribe button. And if you want to be notified when I release the next video in this series, ding that little bell icon. As always, I'd like to say thank you for watching and I hope to see you soon.